now what we, we're not being told is that 84% 80%, of refugees are actually hosted in developing countries and most of them in neighboring countries. Um, so comparatively, Europe is hosting a very insignificant numbers of migrants. Uh, around Only around 4% of uh, European population consists of third country nationals. That's comparatively, that's, that's much less than what we popularly like to believe um, in Europe. So the refugee crisis, which in the end is not only refugee, but it's uh, as someone said earlier, it's because of the refugee um, uh, trend of the last few years, that now it has become a migration, so-called crisis. Um, it's not a, a real migration crisis, it's a management crisis. So we fail at managing a situation that we should be, that is expectable, that we should be uh, able to manage uh, and um, yeah, that we can do. So um, unfortunately this solidarity crisis has uh, closed the, the political window to discuss real solutions such as legal migration routes. Um, so opening safe and legal migration ways is the only way to tackle smuggling um, and, and irregular migration. Uh, so on, on top of that, we, we already mentioned that EU has an aging population and in order to keep our, our social security system in place, we actually need labor force. And migrants are very entrepreneurial and constitute a, a really desirable uh, labor force for Europe. Um, so, okay, action points which are very similar to, to earlier. The priority is to shift the narrative. We need to stop saying that migration is a problem. Um, otherwise. Also, from a local, like from a European perspective, it also then looks like we, we keep on, on putting money and wasting money, and nothing changes. And then we we get frustrated, and we, we look at this whole process from a negative point of view. Um, it also means opening safe and legal migration ways. Uh, how? Um, of course, as uh, we said earlier, uh, opening, uh, making visas affordable and accessible. Uh, maybe having some sort of legal migration uh, uh, schemes based on, for example, on profiles of what is necessary on the, lab the European labor market. And we need all types of skills. We need highly skills, but also, um, uh, I don't know how to put it, but like we need all skills. So um, what we need is the EU to, to make a list of what kind of profiles we need and maybe try to have some sort of similar system. Or maybe even a green card process. We discussed that uh, in previous situation, in previous discussions, uh, more private. But that could also be an idea, more like a lottery system. But to have at least a, a way for people to migrate in a legal way. Um, another idea would be, for example, um, for asylum seekers to be able to lodge the application in in other countries. Uh, of course, we said earlier that that. Um, uh, Fleeing its, its country is not a plan. It's not something that we plan in advance. It has to be done right away. But it would be nice to be able to for them to to plan this once they're in the transit countries or even even at home if they can still do that and not have to do the entire way and go through horrible um, uh, facing horrible human abuses before they can actually um, uh, start uh, their their application process. Third of all, we need the EU to have a unified uh, asylum system, which we're working on, but not really moving um, forward on. Then the integration cha challenge. As I said earlier, we need a um, right-based integration process, giving more rights to migrants, because this is the only way they can integrate. We cannot expect them to integrate if we don't give them the right to work, if we don't give them the right to bring their spouse, and, and if, we don't give him, if we don't give them uh, health services and so on. Um, we need our system to be flexible. They should be able to change employers if they if they face, for example, potential abuse by the employer, but that they need that they know that they need this employer uh, in order to earn this job, this specific job, in order to get to, to keep their visa. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, I also have example of, of local projects that are being undertaken in Lisbon, for example, such as. Um, 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 a mutually recognition recognition of, of uh, qualification, uh, specifically to doctors. That's why I gave this example earlier, which is supposed to be replicated at national level to give um, uh, doctors, migrant doctors in Portugal, the, the right to uh, to exercise in 
uh, reportable. We also have examples in Rotterdam, for example, where they're trying to emphasize on education. They're trying to make um, migrant parents more involved in the education of their children. And to, exam to, to exa for example, to give them language classes or to bring them into the, the, the classroom so that they can actually um, attend the classes with their children and be more involved and learn as well and build capacity. So I, I have many other examples, but we can maybe discuss it later on and I will give the floor to the next one. Thank you so much for sharing those insights. I think one thing I capture is, she says, we should stop complaining about migration. Because many times, countries are afraid of people moving into their country. So it becomes migration is a problem. People actually fall sick when they hear that people are coming to their countries. So I think one thing she says is migration is not a problem. We need to stop complaining about migration. But also, she highlights the fact that visas should be made affordable, but also accessible for people. Because different countries have different regulations. It makes it difficult for people to move. Let me now take this opportunity to invite Mr. Katande Bonwell to share his insights on the approach in the Pacific country. I've been with the organization for many years, so I will not talk just about Uganda, but also some of the locations that I have served. There, within Africa, the reception of refugees is not the same. Many, there are different uh, countries who are handling refugees differently. It's very interesting for me to hear that uh, in uh, Portugal, we are already taking off for uh, ensuring that those qualified uh, refugees uh, can also be working. I think uh, one of the limitations uh, and the fears that people have is the whole issue of freedom of movement. I have been to um, Istanbul. I met with refugees who were registered in Ankara and they couldn't go to Istanbul to play football because their registration does not cover uh, Istanbul. Mm -hmm. I have been to other places also where if you are registered in a camp and then you leave that camp, the police take you and imprison you because you are, you are supposed to be inside the camp. It doesn't matter whether you are qualified or not qualified. That's what is happening in some of the locations. Uganda is not doing that. So refugees who come to Uganda, and I will not talk about migrants, because are, I will talk about migrants later. But refugees who are coming to Uganda are received by government officials, and we as UNHCR and partners support them so that the immediate needs are met and transported to a place where they can stay, which is a settlement. Some of you have never been to a settlement, but I can just give you an idea of how big a settlement will be. If you flew in into Entebbe and drove to Kampala, you would still be in the BDBD settlement. That's how big it is. So when you have a refugee population that is living like nationals within that type of setting, you're actually helping everybody within that way. So the Uganda model is also favorable for supporting the host communities because you are not confining your services to a small location. I have been to uh, other countries where you have a camp of more than 50,000 people living in a very small area where they cannot even grow tomatoes. Here in Uganda, refugees can grow some food for themselves, can also provide for their families within the process. So that's one element in the Uganda model. The second one, uh, which I mentioned earlier uh, yesterday, is about the access to jobs. Now, tell me if Uganda has a uh, low in unemployment rate. No. It's, but it's higher than it's higher like any other country, right? But when you say refugees are allowed to work, you're opening them their mind and their aspirations. 
that if they want to be a driver, they can learn that job. If they want to be a teacher, they can learn that job. And hopefully, sometimes they can get the job. You also are passing a message to the private sector and everybody to say, it's okay to recruit refugees. And if you are recruiting a refugee, he must be paid properly. In other places where they are prevented from working, they work, but they get less money. And if they complain, they are told, but you know that you are supposed not to work here, right? Yeah. So if we have to have the rights of refugees secured, Uganda is securing them by having that policy in place. So that then they can be provided with the necessary elements. The other point is about integration of services. And this is the, the, the place where uh, the support is needed for governments. Integration of services means that if you, there is a school close to the settlement, refugee children are allowed to go and register. If there is a hospital close by, refugees are not uh, prevented from going to that hospital. But then, does that hospital have the capacity? That's the question that we need to ask. Does that school have the capacity? And if the answer is no, then we need to increase that capacity so that uh, the nationals do not feel that uh, their places have been taken over by the refugees. So by increasing those services within the area, you also make it easier for the host communities to say it is okay. I think the other point that he, I wanted to talk talking about how government is receiving refugees is that the land is not enough. But it means that when you provide somebody with a small plot of land, then he cannot go and steal from another person because he has room to, to plant. So now that the maize is growing and everybody is eating, if you are given a plot of land, you have no reason to go and, and steal from the hospital. Because the government has provided for you to be able to have something for your family. It also means that if you have more energy and capacity, you can bless you. You can increase your acreage and grow more and sell the products and make it in you Uganda. The last point is about business. Refugees are allowed to operate businesses. I just came from Kiriandongo, and there I met a very enterprising South Sudanese who's running a bakery. And he has employed more than 15 people. He, in other places, he couldn't do that because the laws were not allowed him to do that. But Uganda is able to provide that environment for that particular person who was running that business before to continue uh, while he, he or she is here. Now, we are promoting recruitment of qualified refugees in this operation. We are recruiting qualified teachers. I've asked the health partners to recruit the qualified health staff in the area because it is the last thing to do. And when you do that, you ensure that they are self-reliant in their communities. And they support the communities that they are. Now, to support uh, what she, uh, she mentioned about the uh, access to visas and things like that for those who want to go and venture in Europe. And those are the migrants, not refugees. Because refugees, when they get to the Ugandan border, they're only looking for safety and security. And I have heard one of them who said, for the first time, he slept without hearing gunshots. That for him was a big difference. I don't think that person would be moving up and down all the way to Europe. But again, if you want to go to Europe, you should be able to do so. Just like if you want to go to Malawi, or Zimbabwe, or, or Kenya. If the European Union provides for his access to visa. In some of the countries, you get it at the airport, right? So you fly from Lisbon, you arrive in Maputo, and then $50 you pay, 
you have entered the, uh, Mozambique. Or you come to Malawi. Maybe it'll be cheaper there. You don't do the same for those who want to go and just uh, see the queen. You don't do the same. If you have to say, I want to go and see the queen, you know how long it will take you to get here, even when you have the ticket. So if we are talking about uh, addressing the issue of migration, it's not about money, because they can afford it. And if you are planning to go, you also know that you stay in a hotel and you have enough money, petrol. You have enough money, you pay, and then you come back. The issue that needs to be addressed is, I think, the youth from Africa and the youth from Europe, they need to talk to each other. They need to talk to each other so that they can address this issue and be responsible for the different areas. It's not about the youth of Africa talking to other people. It's the youth of Europe discussing with the youth in Africa. And this African Union EU meeting, the youth from both continents must be the ones to be able to say, why is it possible for you to come to my house and I cannot go to your house? That's the question, right? But then, why can't we find the solution for that process? That helps me in terms of assurances. So it's not about the African youth discussing what needs to be done but also discussing with the, the European youth together and to find a solution. If it's a global problem, they must have a global solution. And the global solution must be for sites. And it is important that we share information, we share facts from both sides, uh, so that we can find a solution for our people. So my suggestion to you is why can't we have the African Union youth meeting with the European Union youth? And then the two communities come up with proposals for solutions. Because that way, then you can share information about what is going on that side and what is going on this side. I am happy that there are some colleagues here who have come from uh, Germany, others from uh, Europe, but they are not European youth. That's the point I want to make. They came with information from what they are doing on that side. We need uh, the European youth to sit with us to say, my sister, uh, if you, this, we have solved this problem. Can we help out in this way? So, freedom of movement in Europe doesn't mean you can go everywhere. You remain in Greece, you remain in Italy, because they are not free, right? So, we need to find that mechanism. The last point, uh, so that you take too much of your time, but you know, we have to solve this big problem. <laughs> and to solve this big problem, we need to share and uh, exchange ideas. I think that uh, the issue of people traffickers has not been addressed. Why am I saying this? Every person has a mother and a father. So are traffickers. And they belong to a country. Or they are registered somewhere. Right? If, you, if I'm right, you say yes. Because I don't want to make my point to people who don't understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> so if the issue of trafficking needs to be addressed and there has to be put on the table. It's like the issue of corruption. The same you put on the table, you also put the issue of trafficking on the table because the people who are being trafficked, they are people who are getting money out of it. And that money comes from banks, if not banks, suitcases. And those suitcases, they come from certain locations that need to be identified. So there has to be something that needs to be done also related to people who are trafficked. The reason why people are dying in the desert, that's dying in the water in the Mediterranean. It's not that they, they don't know how to get to Europe. Somebody must have told them, I can get you there. And they believe that person, and they pay that person, and maybe they're still paying. If we have alternative route 
that is not by those traffickers, people will still be able to get to Europe and come back. And then tell you to your families, you know, I have been there, don't worry. You come, you, if you want to visit Europe, the best time is June, July. Don't go in November. Something like that. So, please, the youth of Europe, the youth of Africa, deal with the issue of traffickers. They belong somewhere. And I think that with the technology that we have in the world, it's possible to track who these people are. And it's possible that the European countries can help us to say, you know, it is Muhammad or it is this person who is in this location who is doing this traffic. And then we find a solution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Katende, for sharing those insights, for sharing the Ugandan approach to receiving refugees, but also giving recommendations for a global solution. There is need for the youth of Africa to meet with the youth of Europe to get a global solution. This is a global problem. We will now go to our next speaker. Well, um, well, thank you. I was here in the morning, uh, and it was, uh, of course, very nice to be here and hear slightly different um, ideas and, and views which are really outside of the box, because I think what you already mentioned in the morning, that very often we are in this kind of meetings and, of course, using this gibberish, and it's, it's very difficult to sort of step out of it and hear something slightly different. Um, so um, my, my contribution is a little bit slightly different. I, I don't want to really go into why the migration issues, but a little bit more focus on the refugee situation in Uganda. Um, I think what Bornman already mentioned is true. I mean, it is an exceptional policy in Uganda. Where do you, like, where do you look, left or right or no? You hardly can find a country which really has got a policy which welcomes the refugees, which gives them refugee status, and allows them to work and find a business. Uh, and not only that, we of course have right now one million Southerners refugees, um, and the door is still open. So I think it's extremely commendable and, and something what the whole region should take as an example, but also the Europe as an example of how this could be do right, uh, done right. Um, but I think the you know the good policy is only one side of the coin. Uh, at the same time, you have to talk about the implementation. Um, and no matter how good policy you have in place, there is, of course, a sort of set limit how much you can stretch the implementation, how much you can really deliver on what you promise on a paper. And finding a solution to a problem is actually you have to really acknowledge that there is a problem. And I think that's what you have to face. That in Uganda, there's a huge potential to do things right. And they've been already going right. But we have to find a way how to do it better. Um, so what are sort of the hurdles and opportunities? I have a little bit of a short list. Let me start with the first one. Um, I think we are, we are good here that we are not looking at the situation as simply humanitarian refugee crisis. That we are really changing the narrative and looking at is actually what you need is the long-term development aid. What I mean by the long-term de long development aid, it means we are really looking beyond simply providing shelter uh, and food and water, and we really look at something, what is really needed. Uh, it is very easy to say that, but it's very difficult to deliver on it. Because if we talk about long-term development aid, of course, that means many years ahead. That means you have to really plan for the very beginning when you receive the people. You have to understand what are the needs, but also what are the skills and the aspirations. And based on this, you can really deliver on something what can last longer than a couple of years, that those refugees won't end up with a certificate after two months and will never actually work in this area, but that they can really build on something what they want to do and they can eventually come back to the country and sort of be the new generation of the country, which will build the country again. Um, so I see that here in Uganda we go the right direction, but of course it's very difficult. Why is it difficult? Well, we have many actors here, of course. We have many of development and humanitarian actors. And what we try to do uh, on the larger Ugandan scale uh, and work under this comprehensive refugee response framework, this is the same what we actually try to do within the EU itself. In the EU, we have different branches. We have the development branch, the DEFCO, and we have also the humanitarian branch, ECHO. 
And of course, this is a two different mentalities. This is two different approaches to how to solve the issues. And we spend a lot of time to really some, do something what can go beyond one year program, beyond two year programs. And that some other actors can actually pick it up on that and work with it further. Another point is uh, finding a political solution. Um, clearly, if we want to do something to make sure uh, that people have somewhere to return afterwards, after all this development aid, we have to think about that we have to really find a political solution. Uh, far from being easy to deliver on that one, but clearly uh, the, the solution of the South Sudan is in the political solution. Um, third point, I think we should better listen to refugees in the North. And that means really to understand what they want to do, what are their aspirations, uh, and their skills. Um, once you sort of reach these huge numbers of one million refugees, it's very easy to slip into this thinking of, in statistics, you know, percentages. But to really understand what I want to do, to build our programs on what they want to do with their life. Um, so far, of course, we, we very often tend to think that uh, simplify uh, that every refugee has certain farming skills, for instance, that they want to do this. But I mean, when I personally go up north, um, I'm always impressed with one thing, how people quickly adapt to uh, the situation. They quickly establish markets. They, they, they have brilliant ideas what to do. And I think we as donors have to learn how to better respond and encourage them in what they do. Um, point number four is how to better integrate the refugees in the local markets. Um, there have been many interesting research done actually in Uganda over the last couple of years, uh, whether it was from WFP or Oxford Research Center, which looked at how refugees, well, if the conditions are right, how they can positively contribute to the development of the district. Um, there were just a number of research done on this, a number of studies, but I think it shows the right direction. Um, and this is that we changed sort of the narrative and realized, yeah, they can have a positive impact. You know? If we a little bit help them uh, to link the rural areas where refugees stay with the urban areas, uh, we can actually respond to the needs on the ground. That means if, if there's a shortage of workers in the, in, the, in the towns, well, why not to use the refugees who want to work, who want to have a job, and they have their policy here to allow them to work. So why don't we somehow connect them better? Um, I think there's something what we should learn, what we should learn better how to do. Um, there are two different ways. I think very often when we talk about private sector, we, we look at a little bit of bigger picture on the mobile network companies and similar. But of course, very often we, sh we overlook that we have to look below, be below the radar. We have to look at the most elementary uh, markets. Um, I'm always surprised when I go to the settlements and uh, uh, whether it's a new reception center or transit center and you always see within a couple of weeks you see that it completely changes. Uh, people start trading and uh, surpluses from farming, uh, whether from the urban areas. And it's, it's fascinating. I think that's the right way to go. Um, another point, we have to start thinking seriously about the host communities. Um, it's always impressive when you speak with, uh, for me, it's always very impressive to speak with uh, people in the north from the districts and uh, the communities which provide land. Because they say, you know, I was a refugee in the past. Uh, um, those people were here before. And, and, you know, why wouldn't we help them? I mean, it was brothers and sisters. And of course, it's something would, uh, it's impressive. And it is something what hopefully Europe will also learn how to uh, grasp this a little bit better, helping the others in need. Um, and the host communities, the communities who so generously provide land, they have a legitimate right to be rewarded, of course, for this. We are talking about districts which are the least developed districts in Uganda. Uh, they're very scarcely populated. Um, 
and the needs are there. And I think Borwen already mentioned the social services, services, but education. Uh, this, of course, the number of refugees puts a huge pressure to sustain, sustain uh, uh, the number of refugees coming and providing uh, for their needs. Um, so uh, let me sum it up. I think that we really should change the narrative, as Naomi already said. I mean, we are not. We shouldn't help, and we are not. I mean, we cannot help refugees only to grow dependent on the humanitarian and, and on the humanitarian aid. Clearly, the aim must be to help them in a way that they can learn something new. They can study. The youth can study, and they can come back to the country, whether it's in 5, 10, 15 years, and be the new generation of South Sudan. And this is the way we should work all together. Uh, so, yeah, let's change, change the narrative. It's not only passive recipients of humanitarian aid, but people have a huge positive impact on the districts where they are, if the conditions are right, of course. And we are talking about uh, people who will stay here for quite a while, quite a while possibly. So, Let's 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 pull all in the same direction. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Pat, for those insights, but also for the recommendations you give that are very strong. I think one thing he recommends is there's the need to think about the host communities. And and, and I would appreciate when he says when he goes to the north, sees that the host communities are actually availing their land for refugees to, to stay. In Uganda, they opened up a new refugee settlement in Lamo district. It's a district in northern Uganda. There's a refugee settlement there called Palabena. So we are seeing host communities actually providing land for the refugees to stay. So when, we, when he says we think about the host communities, it's a very good recommendation. But also the whole issue of thinking about the aspirations of the youth. It should be the youth to think of what they want. Not every youth is interested in agriculture. And when you move to some refugee settlements, the youth will tell you, not all of us are interested in agriculture. Some of us have expertise in other things. So if we are being told to, to dig, for example, it's not our interest. So it's high time we look at the aspirations of the youth. Thank you so much for those insights. I would now want to invite Ami Mbaki, Director for Assistance and Promotion, Head Office Senegalese Abroad. Thank you. I will speak uh, in French, and my brother Jackie Tay will translate. It's okay. Hello. Je suis. Je suis Madame Jao Amimbate. Je suis la directrice de l'assistance et de la promotion des Sénégalais de l'extérieur au ministère des Affaires étrangères et des Sénégalais de l'extérieur. I am Madame Diao Ami Bake in French. She is a head of the department, uh, head of office Sénégalais abroad. OK. Alors, le Sénégal fait partie des premiers pays à s'être doté d'une loi pour la protection des réfugiés. Il s'agit de la loi 68-27 du 24 juillet 1968, modifié par celle 75-109 de 1975. Euh, toutefois, malgré l'adoption de cette loi, le Sénégal n'enregistre pas beaucoup de réfugiés sur les 3 millions enregistrés pour le moment en Afrique. Yeah. Senegal is one of uh, the first countries to have uh, a law for the protection of refugees. This is the law number 68 or uh, 27 of uh, 24 July 1968. Well, as amended by the law number 7509 of December 20, uh, 1975, yes. However, despite the adoption of this law, Senegal does not register many of the 3 million refugees currently registered in Africa. I mean, in Africa in general, in West Africa? In Africa. In Africa. In Africa. Yeah, in Africa. Alors, au Sénégal, 98% des réfugiés nous viennent de la Mauritanie. Mm -hmm. 
Ils se sont installés entre 89 et 91, coïncidant avec la période pendant laquelle ce pays a connu des perturbations. Ils sont arrivés à des dates différentes et nous viennent pour la plupart de la Gambie, du Rwanda, du Burundi, de la Côte d'Ivoire et de la Centrafrique. Et en 2015, le Sénégal a enregistré 14 274 réfugiés, dont les 13 699 sont des Mauritaniens, qui représentent les 98%. Des enquêtes menées montrent que la majorité veut prendre la nationalité sénégalaise et beaucoup veulent rester aussi au, au Sénégal. Et ceci démontre de leur bonne intégration. Ne disposant pas de camps de réfugiés, le Sénégal accepte que ces derniers vivent avec la haute communauté. Au uh, Sénégal, 98% of the réfugiés sont Mauritaniens. They settled between 1999 and 1991, 1989 and 1991, two years, during which time this country experienced disruptions, you know, a lot of dysfunctionment, and the remaining 2% came from countries like Gambia, Rwanda, Burundi, Côte d'Ivoire, and Central Africa. They arrived at the different dates, and for various reasons. In 2015, Senegal registered 14,274 refugees, including 13,699 Mauritanians, which is a uh, 98% of uh, the number of the refugees in general. And the investigation showed that uh, the majority want to stay in Senegal, and even they are applying for the citizenship, because uh, which showed them that uh, the integration is going well with them. And they don't have a camp like here or a settlement. They, they, they can just live with the community. They can ask for a accommodation anywhere and rent it the way they want. Le Sénégal respecte les normes des réfugiés et a fait des avancées notoires sur le plan juridique. Un décret présentiel a été mis en place en 2004 pour l'installation du comité national chargé de la gestion et de la situation des réfugiés rapatriés et personnes déplacées avec une commission nationale d'éligibilité. Ainsi, les réfugiés au Sénégal sont dans un cadre légal avec l'obtention d'une carte de réfugiés, de documents biométriques. Ils ont accès aux mêmes droits que les Sénégalais. Ils ont droit à l'éducation à la santé, entre autres, comme tous les citoyens sénégalais. Il n'y a pas de discrimination. Oh. Okay. Sénégal respecte les réfugiés protection standards and has made significant progress in legal matters. A degree was put in place in uh, 2004 for the establishment of a national committee to manage the situation of uh, repatriated refugees and uh, displaced persons with a national eligibility commission. They put uh, to a commission we are uh, trying to, to face those challenges to take care of the refugees. Uh, those refugees in Senegal are in a legal framework. With a obtention, they can obtain directly a, a ID card, you know, a refugee's ID card, a biometric document, Uh, they have access to the same right as the Senegalese people. They have the right to the education, to the health, among others, uh, like all Senegalese citizens. There is no discrimination in Senegal right now regarding the migrants and the refugees. Alors, concernant la procédure, les réfugiés s'approchent du comité ou s'orientent au conseil des réfugiés dont seul le président de la République est habilité à octroyer la carte de réfugié. La seule contrainte que nous en avons, c'est une seule contrainte, est que le réfugié n'est pas apte à participer au vote, malheureusement. 
aussi que les banques et les instances sociales le refusent un quelconque soutien. D'autre part, les ressources venant des bailleurs font défaut à cause des crises de longue durée. Je vous remercie. Thank you. Regarding the procedure of abstention of a refugee statute, you can go directly to this commission or to the UNHCR, uh, of which only the president of Senegal, Macky Sall, has the right to grant you the statute of refugees or not. Uh, they, there is some constraint as well. Uh, they cannot vote. Once you are a refugee in Senegal, you don't have the right to vote. Uh, they, we, they don't have so, much, so many support from uh, the private sectors or from the authorities because they deny all kind of support. And uh, on the other hand, uh, resources from donors are lacking sometimes because they are facing a long-term crisis in Senegal right now. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Ami, for sharing the Senegalese experience on hosting refugees. I would now want to invite Humisa Willy, who is a research advisor with the South African Human Rights Commission. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm going to try and give um, a short synopsis so I can see we're running out of time. You know, so I don't like to hear the sound of my own voice. <laughs> um, South Africa is governed by a constitution. Uh, we are a constitutional democracy. I'm sure a lot of you know about the South African constitution, which is um, revered and held to be one of the most liberal in the world. Constitution has a Bill of Rights, and the Bill of Rights um, applies to everyone in South Africa, irrespective of nationality, race, gender, or The Bill of Rights gives people certain rights, such as freedom of movement, equality, dignity. It also gives people certain socioeconomic rights, such as the right to education, um, access to health, um, access to uh, water, and it's only limited by uh, available resources. And of course, these uh, rights are extended to asylum seekers and refugees. So because of the Constitution, South Africa has an urban policy towards um, refugees, which in South Africa are not kept in camps or um, encampments. They are allowed to move around freely. They're also allowed to obtain employment they are allowed to study, and they are allowed to start up businesses. So ideally, this is a good model, and it should, um, theoretically speaking, provide adequate services and adequate protection for those who are most vulnerable. But the issue comes with the implementation. South Africa has issues in terms of implementation. From my own analysis, the implementation is largely caused by uh, lack of political will. Government is facing a situation where it's a developing country. It is uh, trying to establish services for its own nationals. Um, therefore, uh, providing for refugees and asylum seekers is usually used as one of the excuses as to why there are inadequate services for nationals. And of course, we all know this is not true. Secondly, I think South Africa developed a very liberal asylum process, but parallel to that, it restricted tightly access for other migrants. So it became very difficult for you to come to South Africa just to work, or to come to South Africa to just study. So the only available legal avenue became the refugee slash asylum process. This, of course, put a burden on the system. It clogged it, and because a lot of people depended on it. It bred the ground for corruption. Um, the system became very corrupt. Officials became very corrupt. It became very bureaucratic. To give you an, an example, it's gotten to the point where in South Africa, when you arrive, you are given an asylum seeking permit. Ideally, your refugee claim is supposed to be assessed within 180 days. 
that's when the government tells you, yes, you are a refugee, and they give you a refugee status, or they say, you know, you're not a refugee, you don't have a well-founded fear of persecution, you need to return. While you have that asylum seeking permit, you are allowed to work, you are allowed to study in South Africa, and you are allowed to move freely. But now, it takes some people even 10 years to have their status termination process finalized. So for 10 years, you're sitting in this limbo situation where you don't know if you're going to be granted refugee status or not. This is quite unfortunate for refugees because it prevents them from having proper integration into the society. You can't really integrate if you don't know you might be repatriated the following day or not. But it also provides an opportunity for those who do not have a refugee claim to find a legal way of remaining in, the South, in South Africa. Then you see people saying, most people are not refugees. There, is, there aren't no refugees. But it's not because of that. It's because people aren't given a proper legal channel to migrate and to stay in countries. So they use whatever available legal system. And unfortunately, the refugee system becomes the one that people use. So I think from the South African experience, what we could learn is that we need to loosen up our borders. We need to allow people to migrate. We need to allow young people to have access to our own markets as Africans. Let's not be precious with our markets. We've, the notion of borders has never been an African notion. People have always traded freely, moved freely around, but now we are adopting European and Western notions of borders and tightening. This is also uh, quite evident in South Africa's new white paper on international migration, which is starting to see migration as a security issue, framing it as um, a protection of state borders, of sovereignty, where we're establishing um, border, um, border management, where we are establishing um, detention centers around borders, and everyone is getting repatriated. South African Human Rights Commission is currently uh, doing uh, Lindela monitoring, where it is monitoring a repatriation center, which is near the Bay Bridge border. So I think what we can learn from Uganda, and one, one of the things that I found quite interesting, is that you guys are receiving so many refugees, yet you still stay hospitable and welcoming. I would have, from the South African experience, it's quite different. Yes, we also have free movement. We have access to uh, education, access to work and study, but social cohesion is a problem for us. As you all know, we have an issue with xenophobia. And that's not to say all South Africans are xenophobic. Large amount of South Africans are not xenophobic. They live very well and integrate very well with um, non-nationals. But it is those ones that feel frustrated because of lack of governance and because of lack of service delivery from our very own government that then they see and they pick up on the most vulnerable of the community and use them as scapegoats. So I want to thank Uganda, and I'm interested in having more conversations with uh, my Ugandan counterparts and learning from their experiences on how to achieve social uh, cohesion and social integration. Because I think it's very easy for us as Africans to welcome non-Africans, uh, non but it's very difficult for us to welcome each other. Why do we always see each other as a burden and not a source of learning and a source of development? So when we're talking about changing the narrative, I want us to also change the narrative of African migration, not just migration, because we don't have a problem when Europeans migrate from uh, a narrative perspective. We see them as experts. Do they experience problems entering? Well, in my country, everyone experiences problems entering. But in terms of social cohesion and how they are socially perceived and publicly perceived, we very much welcome um, Europeans, Americans. But it, Africans, we don't see Africans as people who contribute to development. We don't see Africans as people we can learn from. We only see a burden. So I think if we can change that narrative as Africans <coughs> and see the value in ourselves and in each other. And I also call on African governments. Let's work for our people. We cannot be spending money on arms and wars and not spending money on access to socioeconomic rights for our own people. Most of the refugees that are in South Africa are from the SADC region. Why? It's because of failed states. It's because of failed economies. So let's work together.
Let's build our own continent. And let's make a continent that we can be proud of and remain. Thank you. Thank you, Willie, for sharing the South Africa experience. Yeah, to covering uh, five minutes on such a broad and complex topic. And I try to draw on the work that Iri has been doing uh, in the last couple of years um, and tie it to what this uh, conference is about. So Iri has mainly been working on displacement within East Africa and the Great Lakes region, um, and not really in Europe. But what we see in the last couple of years is how European migration management policies quite quickly, I would say, in the last couple of years, sort of expand and start to influence um, policies within the region in countries um, in the Horn of Africa, which I will focus on. Um, which, of course, raises questions with regard to what, how will these interventions look like and how should African countries and regional bodies, such as the AU or uh, EGAD or the East African communities, should react to them. So just for example in the context of East Africa and Horn of Africa, um, it's in the emergency trust fund and the Khartoum process and the better migration better migration management fund and a lot of money being thrown into this area in order to manage migration, whatever that means. Um, most recently several agreements between EGAD and the EU on promoting resilience um, and promoting freedom of movement within the Egypt region. And the underlying narratives, of course, remain how do we stop people from getting to Europe? Um, whether we speak about development or we speak about resilience, which is essentially a term within the development uh, discourse, or we speak about smuggling and networking, the underlying idea is how do we stop people from getting to Europe? Um, and in this context, I think there are several points that I wanted to make. And the first relates to borders, and I'm glad you said what you said about borders. And we heard that Uganda keeps its borders open, but yes, borders are quite a recent invention in Africa. Africa has a long history of mass migrations. Um, where people are today was shaped by mass migrations that happened in, before colonial powers came and set borders and um, essentially invented them here. Um, so we have very few examples in Africa of countries that actually push back migrants at the border, as many, Afri as many countries in the West do. So we see Europe um, making it harder for refugees to cross the Mediterranean. We see Israel literally cr uh, closing the border with Africa with a wall. Um, but in Africa, we'll, we'll struggle to find places in which countries stop migrants at the border. Um, could be because they are extremely hospitable or just because they don't have the capacity to do it um, for obvious reasons. <coughs> so, where did I want to go from here? Um, this leads me to another point that I want to make, which relates to restrictive refugee policies um, with regard to refugees that are already in the country. And here the, the, the picture is maybe more complex because we see repressive norms traveling uh, between countries, such as South Africa, Kenya, um, of course, countries in uh, Europe, Australia, Israel, um, policies that limit the rights of migrants, try to push them back um, to where they came from, even though they managed to cross the border. Um, so just for example, we see, of course, encampment policies that you mentioned um, that are being now starting to be implemented in South Africa, obviously have been implemented in um, Europe, in Israel for a long time, in Australia. We see, um, obviously, scapegoating of refugees by politicians, which is almost done everywhere. Um, we see transfer deals between countries in the West and countries in, let's say, the global South, to take refugees and take asylum seekers away. Um, and of course, there's a problematic assumption that harsher measures toward refugees um, will stop migration, both because they will prevent people from migrating in the first place. If they hear that going to Kenya is horrible or going to Europe is horrible, maybe they will just not leave. Um, and of course, the other assumption is that if we treat, if we make the lives of refugees miserable enough, they will go back. This is what Kenya tried to do with Somalis. This is what Israel is doing with um, Eritreans and Sudanese. Sometimes, 
Uh, obviously, there are many more examples, so I just won't get into that. But we see these norms traveling in countries, adopting ideas from other countries, um, both in the policy and in um, even legal cases that courts see the inspiration from other places. Um, and the effect is not very positive, always. Um, so I have to conclude. There's a lot of talk, and we've discussed this over um, today and yesterday, on development and um, root causes for migration. And we've reached the point that we talk about economic development and tribalism and governance and all of these things that are not really migration management per se. And of course, they are important. But there's a risk that focusing on these things um, sort of shifts the focus away from very repressive migration policies that sort of flourish at the same time. And I think, um, yeah, that is sort of the point. Along these steps, there must be a clear commitment uh, from countries, both in Europe and in Africa, to facilitate legal channels for migration and ensure that um, Asylum seekers have effective um, access to effective protection both in Africa and in Europe. So development and peace uh, are all important, and the root causes, of course, and the political uh, aspects of migration are all important, but should not come at the expense of um, limiting the protection of refugees and closing borders. And I think that this is what we see happening um, today. Thank you very much. Uh, we have more or less 25 minutes for the plenary discussion. Um, so if I just quickly wrap up a little bit of the, pro the things that were said that I think are important for the plenary debate. Uh, the approaches by receiving country. In the end, of course, it's communities who integrate refugees. We heard about what's happening in Uganda in the north with people providing land. In my country, there were volunteers, more volunteers than refugees, actually, who are giving language courses, who are inviting people. Um, but of course, it very much depends also on what the policies are. And you were mentioning, of course, policies and also the implementation or the lack of implementation of that, and what type of effect that has um, on <coughs> refugees are being uh, received. Um, I think access to social services was a key issue that was raised, but also, of course, the legal status. We heard about the framework in Senegal. We heard about the framework also in uh, South Africa. Um, another issue which was raised is, of course, programming, inclusive programming, not only involved the refugees in the programming, but also involved the host communities in the programming. I think it's an essential thing which we very often forget um, an example I always give in Greece, the islands where in 2015 more or less one million people crossed through. It was the islanders in Greece who were day and night trying to help people. But after now, two years later, these are the people who feel abandoned by politics because their issues have still not been solved. So you can move from being very hospitable within a period of two years of actually seeing suddenly migrants as a threat because of very wrong government policies and politicians leave feeling abandoned uh, by politicians. We heard, of course, on the pressure on social services, and I think for social peace, it's, in, it's essential <coughs> to make sure we don't get a competition between the newcomers and the ones who are already there, resulting, of course, in scapegoating, in xenophobia, all the negative things we see all over uh, the world. Access to labor market, um, even if difficult to find the work, um, and having the possibility, at least the chance, to be able uh, to, to go to work legally is very important. And I think also no competition on labor rights. Right? Once you start to have like a kind of second-rated uh, citizens and the first-rated citizens, this will create tensions on the long term. Um, the perceptions and the narrative, I always have to smile when I would move somewhere to Africa, I'm the expert, but when uh, our friends here would move to Holland, you're suddenly the migrant, although probably we're migrating for the same reason or finding a, a job somewhere. So uh, the perception and the narrative is, is very important. 
uh, only legal avenue right now, I think, is the same in Europe uh, as, as you would explain from South Africa. Whether you're a migrant or a refugee, the only way you can do is ask for at the same boot for asylum. And sometimes with very long periods of having a decision, and this is, of course, also blocking uh, not only support in the local communities, but also effective integration. And as a last point, of course, also we see sometimes a competition on being the worst host. So the opposite of what Uganda is doing, right? Uganda is proud to be a good host for refugees. But very often, countries don't want to be seen as the most attractive uh, to refugees. So you want to make sure that your neighbor is perhaps a little bit still more attractive than you are, so people don't come uh, massively to your country. This is a perception we very much saw within the European Union, where no one wanted to have the best hosting of refugees because you were afraid that then everyone would come uh, to your country. The floor is yours and please if you have a, a specific question to one of the panelists, uh, make sure for who it is. Thank you and thanks for the presentations. Uh, you did say that integration that there cannot be integration without access to certain socioeconomic rights, uh, access to work, access to health, and education. Um, I think the key for uh, a good integration is also to use uh, an inclusive approach. What I mean by that, I want to bring the experience of South Africa where uh, as civil society and NGOs, we focused for many years on certain slogans where we advocated for migrant rights, refugee rights. And then we realized that actually that was not effective, that we had to change uh, the narrative. So instead of advocating for refugee and migrant rights, we had to advocate for rights to all people living in the country. So when we talk about access to health, access to education, is not just about migrants or refugees, but it needs to be extended to all citizens. So I think it's important for migrants and refugees, wherever they are in, in whatever country, they also need to take part to a certain struggle. So if a particular community uh, want to uh, march to ask for better housing or better service, migrants and refugees should join. So. Uh, and, and I think uh, what we hope is that by changing uh, the, this narrative as civil society and organization will be more effective and that would promote more integration. There in the back. Yeah. Thank you very much. My name is Maria. Uh, uh, the gentleman from the European Union said uh, something about long-term development. I don't think long-term development can be achieved through aid, even amid everything that we do. I think there's a more, there's a more honest conversation about trade that needs to happen, especially in, in terms of policies that are fair to all the nations, not just those who are more powerful than others. But also, when I come from northern Uganda and we host refugees, I actually come from Arua specifically. And one of the things that always comes to light, I was there like two weeks ago, one of the things that always comes light in conversation of hosting refugees is that we have challenges as nationals. There are challenges that nationals face in terms of accessing services, employment, and all of these other things. And the, and the people there feel like the state has a responsibility to protect them over anybody else. So they get offended when their children cannot have jobs, but refugees have jobs within these particular spaces. So that will also take us to the conversation of how do we support these countries beyond just aid? Because we've had this aid conversation for a very, very long time and, and the, the impact is yet to be seen fully. But if trade was emphasized uh, between Africa and Europe, I think there would be better results as opposed to using aid. And also, we train refugees a lot of times and as a young person, um, I've had conversations about technical, service, uh, technical skills and vocational skills for young people and I'm going to challenge everybody seated on that panel that some, some of you are for organizations that train young people in different skills, carpentry, 
I mean, Uganda, one of the famous ones is liquid soap making and, and, and such things. But how many of our organizations actually buy from these young people? How many of them train them with the quality enough for your organizations to actually buy? Because the last time I asked the Danish ambassador this question, he said, well, we have um, procurement policies and blah, 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 quality control. But if you're not training these young people with goods to produce, to make products, the quality that your offices would actually buy, then why are you doing these trainings? Because ultimately, if you're not buying these products first, who should be buying them? So I think there's also a certain amount of honesty that we need to bring to the conversation of development, as opposed to just channeling money to, to fuel big SUV cars and go to the field, but to have more money do the actual work as opposed to operational costs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. My name is Moses and I'm Ugandan. Well, my question goes to Bonwell and maybe some other person. We are looking at the Ugandan model being one of the best models maybe. And my question is how sustainable is it? For example, if maybe the current government changes, mm -hmm. things might change. So how sustainable is this, this Ugandan model and how can we try to entice other African countries to copy the African model because if Rwanda could also m maybe copy the Ugandan model, it would make Ugandan, the, the burden in Uganda less. For example, maybe the other avenue I'm proposing, could we have another conference this, with the same, same theme organized for the youth at the continental level so that maybe in future, after we have gone, after maybe you have gone, they will have the responsibility and it will be in their mind to have maybe right now other countries may not be having a model similar to ours but maybe if we educate the current new African youth at the continental, let's look at the continental level, let's stop thinking at individual countries but if you look at the continental level, how do we capacitate African governments, the future African governments to be more acceptable to our model so that we, 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 the theme is sustainable in future after we have gone. Thank you very much. Um, actually, Maria tipped on what I was about to say. Um, my question is uh, when it comes to, to the EU and uh, funding projects, uh, I would request that you, you're able to support these organizations or support the youth that are doing specific things to improve their lives in terms of development. I'll give an example. You are working with an organization, so you apply maybe for, for funding to partner with an organization that is funded by the EU. And then in that, uh, in that uh, partnership where you're supposed to work for over one year on a particular project, uh, you, you, you have, as an organization, we have people whose, whose lives that, uh, that we are working with. I would say, I'll give an example. We have people who are, who are working with, like Christine, with her story, you know what she talked about yesterday. Some people, we have someone like Bella in the organization. We have someone like Bismana in the organization, Peter in the organization. But all these people are working in the organization, volunteering because to support federal refugees because they don't want to, to, to depend on aid. So you get this partnership with this organization, which is funded by the EU, and then in their clause, you know, of all things, they say they do not pay salaries. But you're working with a team of people, you know, whose stories you've heard as from yesterday, you know, they also have families, but they're just volunteering to manage their lives. So they've got this, this, this kind of partnership, they know that they're also going to be able to improve their lives, but then they say, no, as the EU or as the, in the terms of this funding, we don't, we don't pay salaries, we only focus on this. So how do you expect to support these people? You know, if you're talking about alternatives on migration, how are you going to support these people? These are people who have decided, let's do something for ourselves. But if you're coming in to support, what kind of support are you bringing? You know, where, where is the support exactly? Because, and another thing is that the beneficiaries, staff are not considered as beneficiaries for those things. But remember, among our staff, we have people who are also more like beneficiaries. 
Mm? And the only way you know that you're supporting these people is through that kind of format. So why, 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 is it, why, why do donors, or why when it comes to funding, why should there be such restrictions? Why don't you look at such opportunities that, okay, these are people who are also working, supporting themselves to become self-reliant, they don't want to, to depend on aid, but even the people who are bringing those, uh, those, those projects, they're also paid salaries in their own organizations. Why is it when it comes to the ground in implementation, you put that restriction? We don't pay salaries. That's encouraging like, corruption, and then at the end of the day, the implementation, that's why most projects collapse, because how do you expect Christine, you know, she has a family, she's also supporting a family, but you expect her to come to work every day, you know, because she has been, you, and the question is, how have you been doing it every day? But we have been doing that without this additional project, you know. So we expect at least when we keep working voluntarily like, because we know something good is going to come out of it. We don't want to just sit doing nothing. Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman here and then a question. Yes, thank you. I'm Bizimana Lysien from DRC. Uh, I've heard that actually Uganda has uh, 1.3 million of refugees and uh, there is a confusion um, about uh, the, the point because uh, people are confused about the word refugees. When someone is a refugee, it does not mean he's a criminal or he don't have any rights or maybe his background was bad that has made him to be a refugee. But because of a failure system of government. What I've appreciated in this uh, organization is that uh, we are trying to build up a strong system that uh, will going to facilitate the youth to have their own programs. So for that, I'm going to suggest this. First of all, we need to encourage these organizations supporting refugees activities because uh, I remember uh, last time I've had the Minister of uh, Communication of my country DRC saying that uh, Congo has a uh, thousand of refugees protecting in Congo that's true and maybe Uganda also are doing the same but uh, what's uh, the plan? Because it's like business. What are we going to do now to facilitate those people who don't have a voice? They are somewhere blocking while they have to access to different uh, or positive uh, things that can change their lives. I'm always in and out. I always interact with the young generation an organization but the reality is there is a lot of stories that are not narrated there is a lot of reality that are trying to be neglected while the refugee who is facing who have gone through those things they are the one who can give the true and the, the solution but uh, i really thank this uh, organization because you understood the main points and uh, you are trying to help the young generation to achieve big. When there is no education, there is no future. Let us tackle on education. Maybe after education, we shall have a better understanding of the situation and then the funds will come after. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to add my voice to the Ugandan model. Someone asked about its sustainability. I know Bonwe is going to answer, <coughs> but as a person on the ground, I, I need to say something on this. Our Ugandan model is not only aiming at protecting the refugees, but also at improving their lives, the standards of living for both refugees and the host communities. Uh, that's why 
the services are now shared. And even the assistance now coming from the UN agencies is shared in, in percentages. Out of 100, 70 goes to the refugees and 30% to host communities, especially assistance that can be quantified. Now, the sustainability comes in, in uh, through addressing the livelihoods programs. <coughs> because we think, with this policy, we think, when you equip someone with a skill, because this refugee is not going to stay here forever, we, we are aware that once the instability is no longer in the other mother country, then these refugees will may be, be facilitated or will go back to their country. But how is he going back? For this time that he has been here in Uganda, what, what is the change? Because if someone has acquired a skill, if he has been able to access education to some level, he's going with differently. He has the skills now, and maybe he has the knowledge now, he's able to discuss, to give recommendations for, for, for governance, and for implementation of livelihood activities. So we think they can be self-reliant and self-sustaining even with the skills that they acquired from Uganda here. So that is the element of sustainability. As we think of equipping them with skills, they will use these skills to, to benefit even the generations in their countries. Thank you. I'm Janine Hunter from the University of Dundee. Um, I'm working on a project called Growing Up in Protracted Crises, which is in Uganda and Jordan, working with young refugees who are our researchers and our participants, um, and also with local organizations. Um, what I wanted to ask the panel really was, obviously in Uganda we have some ideal legal frameworks here. Um, how do you think, not only can we persuade other countries to adopt those, but how can it be implemented? Because the findings from our research, which will be coming out shortly, show that refugees here do say that they struggle to find work. There's limited labor market opportunities, limited efforts, um, limited education, um, and there is discrimination. So how can we persuade countries to take on legal frameworks, but also to implement them where they exist? Thank you very, all very much for this suggestion. Really, I really appreciate the fact that the hospitality f uh, from Uganda towards refugees, and I wanted to ask Mr. Kankande why you are putting much attention in settlement and forgetting urban refugees. And also, Imagine since 2015, from Burundi, we had a lot of youth playing the country. But when we are lo looking on these youth, they don't have hope. Some of them, they are not even being educated. And these young, not only Burundian, but even other communities, we, we have many young youth-led initiative. They are working to see that they can improve their life. But when it comes of support, the support is not there. And also this year, the IGA support has been, is not there. So when, and at, at this time, we are talking on this topic of African youth and migration. So if we don't want to, dev to develop here in Uganda, how are we going to, to explain to this youth about migration when even where they are, they are not even developed? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I wasn't really asked any questions, so maybe I'll just throw in another um, point, another question. But there's a lot of discussion about the policy in Uganda and how can it be implemented in other places and what inspiration can it provide for other countries. Um, and I think there's also a need to sort of maybe see these situations less than black and white, closer, black and white, um, I mean, of course, Uganda has a special policy, but if we look at each and every African country, uh, policies and implementation are always vaguer than what they may seem from the picture we see maybe in, um, in the newspapers. Um, and 
it's also useful to take a closer look at the specific conditions. As, as we mentioned, borders are a new invention in Africa. What, what are the conflict dynamics in South Sudan that enable Uganda to have this policy? What sort of history this border, these borderlands have that enable this policy? And once we look at these things, it becomes much more complex to just look at the policy and say, oh, maybe we can just import it to other countries. Because conditions are so different that any comparison, when we look at the nuanced details, becomes very confusing and maybe not very helpful. Um, yeah, You're opening up a new debate, Jotam. But uh, well, I'm sure we can continue it. Uh, <laughs> please. OK, I think, uh, like my <coughs> counterpart here, I wasn't asking any specific question. But I'd like to respond to what uh, Sergio has said. I think maybe when we talk about South Africa and um, refugees, to services and rights, we seem to paint a picture that everybody else in South Africa has equal access, and it's just the refugees that don't have access. But that's not the case. Um, South Africa is a developing country. It is a country that is strife with inequality, which obviously comes from our apartheid history. So the majority of black South Africans are also struggling as much as um, asylum seekers and refugees, and also don't have access to these uh, very same services that are constitutionally enshrined. So I think as well, um, the point that he's raising is important, and we should look at access for our people as well. Thank you. Thank you. You did get some questions. Yeah, I did actually, yeah, thank you. Uh, <laughs> so let me start with the um, long-term development not trade. Um, I couldn't agree more. The idea is to make sure that the, the policies are more held the way that the development aid is not needed anymore. And um, you mentioned the, the soap making uh, projects. Uh, and this is one of the challenges which I think, which I already mentioned, that we have to look at the value chains. I mean, what is the point of training uh, 100 mechanics when there are no cars and we have no idea if they're ever going to use it? And I think this is some kind of new uh, way of thinking about to do really something what people can really start doing immediately after they are trained. They can, you know, improve their economic condition, and uh, you know, they can build on this for the future as well when they come back. Um, so this is the way forward. Uh, you mentioned the 70-30% uh, uh, guiding principle. And two, uh, I should have mentioned that this is exceptional that Uganda has got this principle already written in its policies. And in the programming of the EU, I mean, this is also the guiding principle. But I can tell you, of course, it's very difficult to often implement it, of course, exactly like this, because there are many specific cases where you can just draw a line. You have questions of who is the community? Is it the one in the settlement directly, or are we talking about the those who live in the towns, in the district as well. So of course, practically it is complicated, but I think that this is the way forward. And I think it leads me also to another point, that the, I see that the, the districts are at the forefront of carrying the burden on their shoulders. And this is what we shouldn't forget. And I think it's more and more something what's coming up uh, with the whole picture, uh, that districts are under huge pressure. We have districts where you have more, more than half of the population are refugees. Okay. And it is, it is, of course, unthinkable. It's un unbelievable to think about it. So, of course, the stress on education, on social services, on health, because, of course, refugees have access to hospitals. But you know, there's lack of uh, medicine in the, in the hospitals and uh, pretty practical consequences. Uh, so we should think about better how we can help the districts right now. Uh, we shouldn't think about always about the central level, but exactly about districts. Um, um, maybe a last point. Um, we talk about um, delicate channels. And uh, you know, here in Uganda, we always try to sort of raise the visibility of the crisis in Uganda for the Europe, uh, and so they can sort of see that there are countries which you know, do a great job, and we can sort of also a little bit learn. <laughs> uh, but I think we should step, go a little bit beyond it. Uh, um, one of the legal channels is education, exchange programs. Uh, we have the Erasmus Plus. Uh, I, mean, what, I think what Europe 
was able to achieve through the Erasmus exceptional. I mean, this was crossing the borders. Uh, so why not to somehow extend it and really work in third? Because the whole idea of xenophobia, of, of, of uh, racism in Europe, it very often comes to two things. It's a lack of personal experiences and lack of knowledge. And I think one of the ideas to cross the barrier is by bringing people together, youth, exactly as mentioned here, uh, young people from Africa to Europe. And once you come face to face and can actually realize that refugees are not criminals, uh, those are human beings who have the same aspirations as everyone, uh, you know, this is the way forward. Um, and this is also one way how to cross this kind of um, label that when somehow I come, of course, here to Uganda and I'm like an expert automatically, uh, and not as a migrant, which I am basically from the background. You know. So, as you already said, we should uh, change the narrative so that Africans are not seen as a problem. Thank you. Thank you. And as soon as we finish, you will have to answer her question privately. Um, yeah. yeah? All right. Okay. <laughs> I don't think I was uh, being asked any question. I just want to say that uh, I brought with me some publications uh, from a CDPM on the understanding of uh, African and European perspectives on migration, uh, written by my colleagues. So uh, it's more on the policy level, but it could be interesting. And it's also freely available online, uh, but you just have to read it online. But yeah, I have free, uh, so some copies over there if anyone is interested. Thank you so much for all your questions and for uh, the interest in the discussion we had. I'll start with the, our professor from the University of Dundee. In the settlements, we have candidates that can come to Dundee University. If you only give them online training or opportunities to take some refugees uh, in your courses, that will transform their lives. And they will be transformed while they are in BDBD or they are in Changwale and learning. And we have in those locations youth centers that are equipped with technology, are equipped with the internet, and I think we should make it possible for them. I think that's, that is one, uh, one part that uh, I can ask you to look at. Uh, in Dadab, they have the Kenyatta University, Moy University, open for refugees in there. And the refugees are graduating in Dadab. They are not graduating outside the settlement. Okay. Is promoting and ensuring that it can be uh, successful. Why should it be successful? Because we have been searching for all over to find a model that helps the kids to be self reliant, that helps the kids in hospital to live together peacefully, and we have not found a model that we have here in Uganda. You have heard about South Africa. I was there, my sister, in 2007 in Durban. Uh, in Johannesburg, we met with the refugees who are living in urban areas. It's a very difficult life. And that time, so before the xenophobia, but we could hear it from the, youth, the children, we could hear it from the mothers. When they go to the hospitals to deliver, they, they know they are refugees, they are left behind, they are left without attendance. I know that. But that is not what the model is about when we talk about integrated services. And we need to support this model because it is a model that is based on an African tradition of helping your neighbor. And the, in the African tradition of helping your neighbor, you will do everything that you have to provide for that day. Now, there is a story. If you give me one more minute. Sure. One Thank more. You. <laughs> <laughs> there is a story in the Bible when the, the Israelites were fighting, and Moses had to raise his hands so that they can win the battle. Some of you who don't know, I'll give you the, the references later. Because he was so tired raising the hands, every time their hands went down, they were dying, more people were dying. So other people had to come and make sure that the hands are up. That's how we hold the model of Uganda. We need support from the European Union, we did from the, the, the other uh, international organizations to make sure that this model is successful and sustainable. This sustainability is dependent on how we support the host communities. You heard uh, from Greece how people are now feeling 
we cannot do what we need to do as normal people because we're not being supported. So we need to build capacity within the host communities. We know that there are needs for jobs for locals as well as refugees, but we need to find a solution that is useful, that can be helpful. So I am calling on uh, you colleagues as you discuss to look at how we can make it sustainable. And to make it sustainable means that the other people will adopt the Uganda model. If we don't support them and then they find it not good to continue with that model, other countries will say, we told you so. So we need to really work hard to make sure that this model works. The the issues about the uh, urban refugees in Uganda, I think we can discuss that uh, after my minute is gone. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to finish by saying that the youth of Europe and the youth of Africa must find a talking place to talk themselves. Because the exchange is not just about visiting, you can exchange through internet and other, other elements. But if you can find a way of looking at the problem from different sides, and then we encourage the youth from Europe to talk to the European Union and the youth from Africa to talk to the African Union, then the adults are going to be faced with solutions that fit the two communities. And I would like to encourage you to do so. And the, for those that uh, have other questions, we'll be able to talk about later before I that. But thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you very much. May I ask all of you to have a big round of applause for yourself, for the active debate, but of course for the panelists. Thank you very much, and of course for Susan. <laughs> Enjoy your coffee, and we start again at uh, 4 o'clock.